and to everyone out there watching us at home. We are an open and inclusive congregation. Our members walk diverse paths, find meaning and purpose, but we are united by our belief in the inherent worth and dignity of all. My name is Linda Heidenberg, and I've been an active member since uh, 2015. Our speaker today is Reverend Pat Job, who joined us in 2020, just during the COVID beginning. It was a tough time. We did it all on Zoom for many years. Uh, opening words, Pat. Yes. My March my opening words are a joke, but before I tell it, I want to invite Laura Daly to come down. Our membership chair, Marjorie Flowers, is here with the membership book. And Laura, who has built dog fences and otherwise been engaged with this congregation for several weeks now, is fixing to sign the book. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you. I'm so happy to be here. Is that it? And now I correct my name? We probably would have figured it out. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. You. Yeah, welcome. We're so I didn't realize I was going to be up here. I would have dressed a little bit. Got <laughs> 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 my hair. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. So, as I mentioned, our opening words are a joke. And the, the reason I'm telling this joke is because... Sandy McFeely, our distinguished and beloved president, and I were noting last night that uh, communications is a delicate art. And we were dealing with the fact that about four different people had been communicating with each other around this particular service, and we, we still aren't sure that everybody got the words that they needed. And it reminded me of the, the preacher who was walking along, saw a fella plowing his field, and he said, brother, are you lost? And the farmer said, no, preacher, I'm not lost. We just live right over this hill here. He said, you don't understand what I'm talking about. He said, what I'm asking you is, are you a Christian? And the farmer <coughs> said, no, I think me and my wife are Presbyterians. He said, <laughs> he said, you, don't, you still don't understand what I'm talking about. Are you ready for the judgment day? And the farmer said, well, I don't know. When's it going to be? And the preacher said, well, it might be next Tuesday or Wednesday night. And the farmer said, don't tell my wife, she'll want to go both nights. <laughs> in, a, in, addition to, in addition to opening words, Linda, I want to recognize that we have a very distinguished guest in our presence. Fry Gilliard has written some of the best books I've ever read in my life. And I'm not just saying that because he's in the room. Uh, he, he is a wonderful chronicler, especially of Southern life especially of um, the civil rights movement, uh, country music. Um, he's a genius. And if you don't believe me, just ask me. <laughs> Fry, welcome. We're so glad you're here. Okay. Please join me in the words that are written for the chalice of lighting that's in your bulletin. We light this flaming chalice to illuminate the world we seek. In our search for truth, may we be just. In our search for justice, may we be loving. And in our love, may we find peace. Okay. Now Pat has a story for the kids. Okay, oh, let me just, get the folks who want to hear in. the story for all ages to come down. We got two back. <laughs> You're up. Yeah. They got here just in time. You made it. You made it. And, and the reason I'm standing up here is because last Sunday I watched the service online and when the storyteller gets down on the floor with you guys, he or she disappears. So uh, I'm going to stay up here and, and let, uh, let Quinn keep me on camera. There are two poems here. And the first poem I'm going to read you is about a lamb. You know what a lamb is? A little baby sheep? Yeah, like a little baby sheep. 
they're the most, well, the ones in this story anyway are white, okay? So you got this little, little white lamb, and she is right here in front of you in your imagination, and she's asleep, okay? Little lamb, who made thee? Dost thou know who made thee? Gave thee life and bid thee feed by the stream and o'er the mead. Gave thee clothing of delight, softest clothing, woolly bright. Gave thee such a tender voice, making all the veils rejoice. Little lamb, who made thee? Dost thou know who made thee? Little lamb, I'll tell thee. Little lamb, I'll tell thee. He is called by thy name. For he himself, for he calls himself a lamb. He is meek and he is mild. He became a little child. I, a child, and thou, a lamb, we are called by his name. Little lamb, God bless thee. Little lamb, God bless thee. Isn't that a pretty poem? For a little lamb who's in your imagination right here in front of you asleep. Now, the second part of the story is that there was a tornado yesterday in parts of Mississippi and Alabama, and it actually, another storm just this morning, hit Western Georgia. And when the storm hit a zoo in Western Georgia, two tigers escaped. Now, the word is that they are not out there on the sidewalk. They have been recaptured. But in your imagination, I want you to put a tiger right outside that door on that sidewalk. Okay? And then I'm going to read you another poem. Tiger, tiger, burning bright in the forests of the night. You got to imagine it's also night, okay? Tiger's out there on the sidewalk and it's night. And the tiger is looking through the door at us. <laughs> tiger, tiger, burning bright in the forests of the night. What immortal hand or eye could frame thy fearful symmetry? In what distant deeps or skies burnt the fire of thine eyes? On what wings dare he aspire? What the hand dare seize the fire? You're doing good backing up. That's a good thing to do. <laughs> and what shoulder and what art could twist the sinews of thy heart? And when thy heart began to beat, what dread hand, what dread feet? What the hammer, what the chain? In what furnace was thy brain? What the anvil, what dread grasp? Dare its deadly terrors clasp when the stars threw down their spears and watered heaven with their tears. Did he smile his work to see? Did he who made the lamb, that little lamb right there, make thee? Tiger, tiger, burning bright in the forests of the night. What immortal hand or eye could frame Thy fearful symmetry. And the only other thing you need to know before you go to class, y'all going to class? Okay. Before you go to class, you need to know the same guy wrote both poems and he believed the same force, the same creative energy made that little lamb and made that tiger out there on the sidewalk. Okay. You can go to your classes. Go now in peace, go now in peace. May the spirit of love surround you everywhere, everywhere you may go. We have a special pinch hitting uh, musician today. Eddie's going to do the centering music. Thank you, Eddie. You're welcome. Thank you. It's my pleasure and honor. Okay. This is the break from A Lighter Shade of Pale.
center. Eddie, thank you so much. We, we are bereft of our regular musicians today, and Eddie often, often plays second harp, but today, today first harp really did, really did work, buddy. We appreciate it so much. We are now at the, uh, just past the two and a half year mark together, and I'm so glad y'all are not yet tired of me. Thank you. Thank you for not running me off. <laughs> Gail Arnold just gave it. <laughs> but I just I want to tell you that there there is a there is an element to this work that is a little bit challenging. Challenging is a good that's a good solid word. I'm not going to say it's problematic because that sounds negative. But when you think about what I do and what Charlie Tyler does and what Gary Phillips does and what Eric Bannon does, we do it and then we have to do it again. And we have to do it again. I think it was Michael Jordan who said, you're only as good as your last game. But I really, I really want you to put aside Gail Arnold's hand gesture. <laughs> And I want you to put aside the idea that um, two weeks from now, I'm going to be back and do it again. <laughs> and I want you to be with me in a, in a very different way this morning, because this, this is a journey that I began 50 years ago when I was a freshman in college. And my beloved, precious college English teacher, Shirley Raleigh, introduced us to William Blake and read us Tiger, Tiger, Burning Bright in the Forest of the Night, and read us Little Lamb Who Made Thee, and made it very clear to us that there was nobody else in the world like William Blake. So here we go. Most of us know what we believe and what we have questions about. For the most part, we are supremely confident that science has a pretty good grip on what's happening and how we might negotiate our lives with reason and thought. You'll go along with that, won't you, Arvin? Ar Arvin's my science guy. He told me several weeks ago that Unitarian Universalists have a lens, have a filter that's called science and reason. William Blake, the poet and artist, blew all that certainty out of the water. Like many of the mystics we talk about here, the late 18th and early 19th century Blake offered a view of the universe that looped in traditional religion and his own visions to ask, who made thee, little lamb? And he asked other questions that might rock our worlds on a Sunday afternoon. Like George Harrison, Blake believed all of us are a potential Jesus Christ. Another group of thoughts on mysticism. That which might remain mysterious might give us insight into that which we cannot see, voices that we cannot hear. It is certainly another appeal for an open mind that might lead to an open heart, that might lead to what Rudolf Otto called an emotional wave of the numinous. Something like standing on the edge of the Grand Canyon and saying, all this? I promise not to always be talking about mysticism, Arvin. I really, I, I really will. I promise. <laughs> but let's do it one more time. William Blake was a poet, lyricist, artist, printer, plate maker who lived in relative poverty, dressed very shabbily, and was unknown to all but a tiny group of friends and fans at the time of his death in 1827 at the age of 69. Before he died, his best-selling book sold about 50 copies. That'll make your heart stand still, won't it, Fry? <laughs> 
And yet today, almost any English major can recite Tiger, Tiger, Burning Bright in the Forests of the Night. The, Fol the Poetry Foundation calls it one of the most anthologized poems in the entire canon of English literature. And although I won't ask for a show of hands, I imagine you're hearing it quoted would prompt many of you to think, I've heard that. I've heard that. The obscure, relatively poor, disheveled William Blake was vaulted to the heights of fame, even if somebody else made the fortune during the Romantic period. For one simple reason, he was on to something. He was on to something. And it was not the invention of the locomotive or E equals MC squared. Blake stepped out of childhood visions of angels and being enchanted by the forests and rolling hills of beautiful English countryside to question the nature of reality, much in the same way Einstein did 100 years later and come to a very different set of conclusions even though the similarities between their conclusions are a bit startling. Blake, in sometimes almost incomprehensible mythology, concluded that God and angels and ghosts and giants and other creatures we think to be fictitious are in fact as real as the backs of our hands or the ground beneath our feet. But only real only real as they are creations of the very highest forms of human imagination. Put that in your pipe and smoke it. If that sounds self-contradictory, hold on to your seats. Consider placebos. We all know that people are sometimes healed by sugar pills because some doctor tells them those pills are the latest pharmaceutical creation that has had great results in curing what ails. And they get well. Although I can't testify for sure, I feel like Blake would say the imagination made that pill work. What would you say, Dr. Arnold? The imagination made that pill work. As confusing as this may seem, I beg you to stay with me because I genuinely believe that we are considering this afternoon the core of the religious experience. I believe everything I'm about to illustrate is not just true of Blake, but also Jesus, Buddha, and Mohammed. And I know there's not many other churches in Mecklenburg County where I can get away with saying that. <laughs> Just as the patient believed the placebo had curative powers, Blake believed he had seen angels in the trees of his childhood. So maybe the operative word in this presentation is believe. Willie Mays used to tell the New York Yankees, boys, we got to believe. We got to believe. Henry Ford is credited with saying, whether you think you can or you think you can't, you're right. Substitute the word believe for think in that sentence. Whether you believe you can or believe you can't, you're right. Is it therefore the truth that the placebo cured the patient or what the patient believed about the placebo created the cure? Is it therefore true that Blake saw angels in the trees of his childhood or was it what he believed about what he saw? in those trees that created those angels. I'm looking out at the trees now to see if I can spot any. I really would have appreciated it if they had showed up. Blake believed there is what he called a fourth level of imagination. He wrote that we could reach that fourth level and see into worlds that human beings have affirmed for as long as there has been recorded history. But he did not believe those worlds we're separate from the state of imagination that allows us to see them. Now, some of you are having a little difficulty with this. That's to be expected because William Blake was one of the most unusual human beings to ever walk the earth. Consider just one line from another famous poem I quoted two weeks ago. To see a world 
in a grain of sand. Okay, that's pretty. That's poetry. But how exactly do we do that? A world, a planet, an individuated sphere with islands and mountains and little lambs and tigers? That's too much. Or is it? Can we imagine an atomic microscope that would let us see deeply into that grain of sand? And might we imagine the subatomic structures of all the elements comprising that grain of sand? I think Joe's with me. Would it look like a world if it were not magnified thousands of times? Blake is always offering us, as confusing as it might be, his conclusions about worlds living in grains of sand, which are based in his continuing affirmation of his flashing imagination. What he believes he what he believes created creatures and visions as real as the backs of our hands are the ground on which we stand. Does this feel silly or unlikely? Careful, careful before you write off the theology and philosophy and mythology of William Blake. Might you take one more look at Einstein's theory of relativity? The 19th century into which Einstein was born and during which Blake died was an ongoing rumble of the iron horse, the light bulb, the telephone, and paved streets. Suddenly the world felt like meat and clocks. Everything was measurable and weighable, and if it didn't fit into a materialistic pattern, it did not exist. Space and time were good examples of that which could be measured. But hold on, Bessie. Whoa, back. Einstein said not so fast. Space and time are relative to speed, especially the speed of light and the universe is curved and things we have assumed since Galileo and Copernicus ain't necessarily so. Those were not Einstein's words. Those were mine. <laughs> Subatomic physics went on to obliterate assumptions about reality to the point that Niels Bohr said, matter does not exist. Now there's a reality check that's hard to cash. The comedian Stephen Wright said, I woke up this morning and everything in my apartment had been replaced by exact replicas. <laughs> There's some imagination for you. Most of what you are hearing today comes from a book called William Blake versus the World by John Higgs. I have been reading the book like an inspired child who discovered Spider Man or the Hulk, and I have been carrying it around like some fundamentalist carry around the King James Bible. You know what the fundamentalists say about the King James Bible. If it was good enough for Jesus, it's good enough for me. <laughs> I once drove by a sign, a sign on the side of the road that read, Fundamentalist, King James Bible reading, free will, evangelical, and spirit-filled. I let out a groan of shock and dismay that prompted one of my daughters to say, it's hard to have fun with the mentals, isn't it, Daddy? <laughs> but as much as I do not think of myself as a fundamentalist, I have been reading this Higgs book with that same zealous passion. Just a few pages from the end of the book, which I put off as long as I could, Higgs walked us through several world religions. He begins with Christianity because William Blake claimed to be a Christian. But Higgs argues that Blake could not have been a Christian in any traditional sense of the word because he believed Jesus had visited ancient England and even more radical, he believed all gods and angels were the fruit of human imagination. No less real than his childhood visions, but still the fruit of human imagination. No traditional Christian is going to bite that hook. He moves on to Buddhism and says Blake's cu couplet about seeing a world in a grain of sand and heaven in a wild flower is very Buddhist, even Zen Buddhist, especially. But says Blake was far too active, far too energetic to have taken the Buddhist path of acceptance. 
Next, Higgs refers to scholars who have figured Blake for a possible atheist. Because again, he believed all angels and gods were the fruit of the highest forms of human imagination. But Higgs goes on to say that no atheist would ever argue that everything that lives is holy. That's another quote from Blake. Everything that lives is holy. We are finally led to something that many of us have never considered. Divine humanism. This is not the secular humanism so many of us have found appealing in our modern age colored by the likes of Carl Sagan. Secular humanism argues that hum humanity can be as good as possible without the need for Blake's angels and gods, no matter where they might have come from. Divine humanism elevates the best of humanity into the realm of the divine and the worst of it into the demonic and monstrous. This is why he famously wrote The Marriage of Heaven and Hell and helped to see what Carl Jung would see later as the need for all people to recognize our personal demons. Jung called it the shadow side, but regardless of what we call it, Blake knew it was there and dangerous and needed to be integrated in order to be balanced. But what Blake also believed, and Higgs spends 342 pages deliciously simmering and serving and, and serving in steaming plates, is this radical, which I would offer is a very Unitarian idea, that the whole of all that is divine is contained in the wonderful human imagination. Some scholars have offered that magic mushrooms might well have been at the heart of most world religions. <laughs> that Jesus and Muhammad and Buddha ingested psilocybin or peyote or some other hallucinogens and those visions of angels and gods came rolling in like the electric Kool-Aid acid test. But Blake found his angels in trees as a child. He also didn't go to school. He was homeschooled. He found those visions as a child and spent the rest of his life defending those visions in a panoply of art and poetry and prose and mythology that is staggering in its variety and intensity. Much of it very dense and difficult to read. William James argues in his Varieties of Religious Experience that these things, while not common, are well documented and offer us a very different view of reality from what Blake called Newton's sleep. The anesthesia he saw falling over the whole world of humanity because of Isaac Newton's meat and clock view of the universe. And finally, what difference would any of this make? Blake advocated forgiveness and compassion, empathy, especially if every living thing is holy even your chickens. Divinity, sacredness, holiness was present in the tips of his fingers and the art and poetry he created with those fingertips. He was world class, major league, top drawer, and he had a fierce passion and conviction. As one of my friends from Eastern Carolina would sometimes describe a superlative, he won't know baby. He won't know baby. He, he was a broken dam of flooding creative genius, a lighthouse of strange and beautiful visions and creatures and supplication to all of that, like Beethoven writing music or Babe Ruth swatting home runs out of Yankee Stadium. How might he be of use to us today? He might help us see that among our contemporary abusers of religion, there are still kind, empathetic, compassionate, and giving people who are not mentally ill as they embrace various religions. Maybe we can cut them some slack as we listen to them share with us of what would they have found among their angels and gods as though some of it might have made some sense. Maybe even enough sense to lead them to productive lives that enrich us all. Now let's talk about it. Linda and I are going to lead a talk back.
but somebody out there. Let's call. Let's call on Gail Arnold. Speak first. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. That, that really works for me because you got to be whatever works for them as long as it, it's a positive thing. Right. As long as it's a positive thing, as long as it doesn't hurt anybody else. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Eddie? I looked up in the tree and I saw a bird. There you go. And did you feel like all that lives is holy? I did. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. you opened my eyes. <laughs> Good. Good. Anybody else? The dark cloud or crew, um, some of the, I don't have a problem with the beliefs of evangelical Christians, other than their belief that everybody else is going Yeah. <laughs> Unless you believe what they believe. In. And at that, you know, at that point, I'm, listen. Yeah. I've told you all before about being out on the playground over here next door. And I struck up a conversation with a woman who was there with her grandchildren. And, and I said, are you involved in a religious organization? As I often ask people at uh, gas stations and different places. She said, uh, she said, yes. She told me the name of the church she attends in Charlotte. And she said, where do you go to church? I said, well, I go to church right next door in the Quaker meeting house. I said, we're Unitarian Universalists. I said, we don't believe in hell. She said, oh, my goodness. <laughs> it's just, it's incomprehensible to so many of them, to so many of them. My mother said she couldn't believe in universal salvation because she didn't want to spend eternity with Hitler. Yes? Is, is imagination something you are born with or is something that you develop as a result of living? Yes. <laughs> just in case anybody at home didn't hear Arvin's question he said is imagination something you're born with or is it a, or is it the result of living your life I, I think an even more interesting question is clearly uh, the two girls who sat here with my lamb today I asked him to imagine uh, a sheep and I mean a lamb. I, I guess they did okay. I, I don't know what came into their imaginations, but what really becomes challenging is when something jumps up that appears to be real and we have to deal with the fact that it may be the result of our imagination. I'm not going to say nothing more than imagination because in its reality, uh, it can certainly have an effect on us. And it's, and it's mythology. Think about the power of mythology. You all know that I believe in Santa Claus. And, and the, the reason for that is because it's such a powerful myth. Uh, my mother told me at eight years old, she said, when you stop believing, he stops coming. So I kept right on believing. Uh, I, have, I have two comments. Uh, being a musical theater kind of geek, uh, talking about the little lamb, uh, there's a song in Gypsy uh, where the little girl is talking to her little lamb. And do you really know who I am? It's part of it. And, you know, it makes me think. Now, you know, I always thought she was talking to her little lamb, but maybe she is talking to Jesus. And uh, um, it's a whole different. You've opened that up to me for that song. Um, the other song that came to mind is It Ain't Necessarily So. Johnny Mercer, I believe, right? Uh, uh, you know, so I, I, I'm always hit with musical connotations or synchronicities or whatever you want to call. Right. Um, Johnny Mercer wrote that with Albert Einstein. Uh -huh. Really? <laughs> <laughs> but that, but that was definitely Einstein's conclusion. That's that's what Einstein came to was everything you have once thought about the structure of reality. Ain't necessarily so. Mm -hmm. Yes, Jane. Um, I remember a book. I think the name of it was Arthur Rex, <laughs> Dr. King Arthur. Okay. And I was struck by the last sentence in it, which is something like this. 
So is the tale of King Arthur, who never existed, but everything he did was true. There you go. And that made so much sense to me, because in some ways, I, I was a real book reader. And for, for example, uh, the world of Middle Earth and Lord of the Rings was more real to me than a lot of the reality I saw every day. And I absorbed the characters, I absorbed the situations, and they became a part of me. And I think the imagination can affect your actions and your life and how you deal with other people in a very powerful way and can be true even if they didn't actually happen. Anybody who's ever read Stephen King would agree with you about that. <laughs> Anybody else? I, I read yesterday, I can't remember what county it was, it was in North Carolina, a Moravian Church donated over $3 million, I think, to pay off people's medical bills in the county. Wow. Just so they didn't have that hanging over them anymore. And I just thought that was just uh, incredible. The, Mor the Moravians are, are extremely nice people. Yeah. Uh, my first cousin, who's also a minister, made a real study of them. And she said they're so nice that every time there's a fight that breaks out in the congregation, they just go start another church. They don't, they don't want to argue with each other, so they just, they just uh, split and move down the road. Jim. Uh, well, I was just piggybacking, piggybacking a little bit on Barbara's uh, comment, but uh, the most vivid imaginations you ever encounter with children. Yes. And that's one of the things I love about children. They have a wonderful imagination. Yes. Yes. And and Blake, Blake as a child, was apprenticed to a man who needed him to go into uh, Westminster Abbey and measure the tombs of the famous people who were buried at Westminster Abbey. And Higgs ends the book by talking about the fact that now Blake has a bust in Westminster Abbey where he used to, as a child, climb over all these iconic <coughs> figures and look at all this stuff and how he integrated it into his art. I know most of you won't do it, but I hope that some of you will go home and go to Google Images and look at the art of William Blake. It's, it's truly extraordinary. This is not God. This is not God on the cover of this book. This is one of Blake's four uh, sort of uber spirits. This guy's name is, is Urizen. And Urizen mistook himself for God as part of Blake's mythology. And the, the round uh, orb behind him is the heaven that he's ignoring, the presence of what Blake would call the real God. Uh, but, but these figures were very real to Blake, and I could just go on and on. <laughs> Thanks okay. so much, Linda. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, let's see. We're passing the basket. Uh, this fellowship is important to us all. The contributions we make today allow us to sustain and grow our congregation and to reach out to our community, both nearby and the larger world. Your giving affirms our commitment to each other and keeps us going. In the spirit of St. Patrick's Day, I will play Danny Boy. <laughs> Come on, pass the basket. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> Dig deep, dig deep.
We're so grateful to have Eddie with us. Uh, thank you, Eddie. Thank you, Ray. <laughs> he didn't know he was doing that until we walked in today. <laughs> but uh, we had no other music. I kept asking for people, do you play this? Do you play that? No. Uh, so if you ha do have any musical talents, let us know. Okay, so we're, uh, yeah, that was nice. Um, with grateful hearts, we receive these gifts. May they encourage us to live lives of integrity and compassion. Now look on your programs here for the announcements. Um, uh, Autumn has a new mystery match uh, thing going on. The, the details are in your newsletter. Uh, there is a deadline of uh, the 31st, which is Friday, I think. Uh, so anyway, uh, sign up for that if you're interested. Our social suppers, uh, we invite anybody that wants to go out for a bite to eat after the congregation. We're going to Crafty Burger today. Uh, so uh, let me know if you're going so I can kind of know how many are going. Uh, uh, movies, uh, we're going to go see A Good Person on Tuesday. I don't know much about it, but Morgan, Morgan Freeman is in it. And <laughs> I love him. Anyway. Um, uh, the auction's coming up on the 29th. Um, I need volunteers for wine and beer. Uh, so I've got like five bottles of wine so far. I think we could do with a little bit more than that. Uh, you need beer too, right? Beer, uh, yeah, one or two six packs would do. Last time we had two cases, way too much. Uh, but uh, one or two six packs would be good, I think. Um, and uh, there's a book club and they, the UU Animal Ministry. Uh, I think they did something yesterday, right? In the rain, in the mud. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for that. Um, okay. Uh, closing song, which is... Hang on just oh, wait a minute. I, I just want to remind people one more time about the uh, event oh. Thursday at Johnson C. Smith University. I know some of us have registered... Has anybody who has not registered willing to read one of these little sheets of paper one more time? Not overwhelming enthusiasm, I can tell. Okay. Here you go. Are you all registering? Okay, well, this is a memory job for registering. Anybody else? This is a this is a chance for us white people to show up at an event that is involving a lot of African American organizations on the campus of a historically African American university. And we're never going to be the diverse congregation that we dream of being unless we show up in the African-American community. They need to know who we are by our being there for them. Okay. I've got these if anybody wants one after service. Join me uh, in 123, Spirit of Life. Uh, You know this? I have no idea no, how it don't, goes. Don't <laughs> Spirit of life, sing, sing for it. <laughs> it's in C. It's in C. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know how to play it. I mean, I played it. It's in two. I played it, but I don't know how to get it started. Spirit of life. Spirit of life. Come unto me. Sing me my heart. All compassion, blow in the wind, rise in the sea, move in the land, giving life the shape of justice, roots hold me close, wings set me free. Closing, closing words for you. <laughs> Our closing words are from William Blake. To see a world in a grain of sand, and heaven in a wild flower. To hold infinity in the palm of your hand. 
and eternity in an hour. Okay, please join me in the extinguishing the chalice words. You know, I don't remember. <laughs> we extinguish this chalice, but not the light of truth, the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment. These we carry in our hearts until we meet again. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> Make sure I ring the gong. <laughs>